All right, guys, the last part of, of um, this uh, part A and part B that we're going to look at is in, uh, specifically with investment in Mozambique Lumen's usage. Um, all right, so Joe then diversified its operations into another African country by acquiring 75% in the ordinary share, uh, share capital of Mlu on the 1st of January 20, um, 2018. Okay. Okay, so we are, our year end is 30 June 2019. We have 1st of July 2018. So then this brings us back to 1 Jan 20, uh, 2018. All right, and then they also tell us that um, from the definition of IFRS 10, we obtained control, which is cool. Now, all assets and liabilities were fairly valued except for machinery with a carrying amount of 2050 and a fair value of, of 2.3 million on, on that particular date. Yeah. So again, I've put together a little analysis for, for you guys on MLU. All right, so we have um, yeah revaluation of machinery. The carrying around two hundred five zero fair value two three, which means our revaluation is two hundred fifty thousand metrical. All right, and then our deferred tax. They told us in the question in the additional information that the tax rate in Mozambique is thirty two percent. So our deferred tax is one hundred eighty thousand, eighty thousand, which then leaves us with a net of seventy thousand. So we include that in the value of our pie at at acquisition date. Okay, um, it had a useful life of four years. Okay, so we know that because we have that asset that's been revalued, we're going to have to depreciate it or increase the depreciation. So in year one, which is <clears throat> if we look at the um, timeline that we drew, we have six months of year one and 12 months of year two. All right, so year one, we have six months of, of depreciation over a four year useful life. Deferred tax at 32%, which then gives us a net, which we've included in our in our analysis, 21,250. And for year two, 62,500. So obviously, because we've got the, the asset for the full year, our deferred tax at 32%, which then gives us a net of 42,500 that we've then included in our, our analysis. Okay. Um, all right, so that, that valuation is done. And then they tell us, they tell us further that we then decided on the 30th of June, 2019 to sell 15%. So right here at this point, we then decided, okay, we're going to go from 75% shareholding to 60% shareholding. Okay. And then they give us the equity at, at the respective date. So at acquisition date, okay. Ooh. At acquisition date, we had share capital and retained earnings of 1.114.25. So we've included that 1.114.25. Okay. As at the beginning of the year, we can see throughout the share capital hasn't changed, but we see that retained earnings up to the beginning of the year has moved. So 14.9 minus 14.25 gives us a retained earnings of 650 that we've included in our total column. And then obviously in the current year, 14.9 to 15.825 uh, is then going to give us the 925 profit for, for the current year. Remember, guys, that this change in ownership only happened at the end of the year. Then they give us all the necessary exchange rates. So at acquisition date, we have a 0.21 average for the first year. So what we then go do is we go slot this in. So at acquisition date was 0.21. Average for the first year was 0.22. Our closing spot at the end of the first year was 0.23. Now, one of the things that I want to point out, guys, here is that on the depreciation, they would have then um, adjusted this or put through these pro forma consolidation journal entries at the end of the year. So this is not something that's been journalized month on month. It's a, it's a pro forma or an adjustment that we make when we do the consolidation at the end of the year. So that is why they've used the closing spot specifically for the depreciation in the two years. But the retained earnings will then be translated at the average, and I suppose the profit as well would be at the average of, of the respective years. Okay. So what we're able then to do is if we have the, the value of, of the pot at acquisition date, we can calculate what is the value of the pot in Rand. We know we own 75% of that. And we paid, well, they said that we paid fair value. Um, 
So we know we own 75%, uh, or they told us that we paid fair value for this. So we can see that we have 100,000 shares. Okay? We own 75% of that, which is then 75,000 shares. And they've given us the fair value of 190 metacash at, um, at that date. All right. So if we look at our, our calculation, how we calculate the consideration, it's 100,000 shares times 75% uh, times the 190 met um, for the fair value. And then we use the spot rate at that date to bring this back to RAND. And by doing that, we're able to calculate our goodwill, which in RAND is uh, 548,100. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So that's just pretty much the, the information that, that they've given us. So if we go back to our analysis, we can see then our NCR we're able to calculate. We're then able to calculate the RAND equivalence on our movements. And obviously, like we've said, our balancing figure, which I'm going to highlight here in a light blue, is our, our FCTRs. Okay. So all of those come from, from the calculations, the difference effectively between a spot and the closing, um, the average rate for the year and the closing spot at the end of, of each period. Okay. Now, you guys will remember that this particular question said that our NCI is recorded at proportionate share, not at fair value. Okay. Which means that we don't have goodwill in the NCI, which then means when we translate this goodwill, that means the full translation of that then belongs to the parent. Of, of the sub. So how we calculate, so this is obviously the calculation that we've done for the FCTR and all the other assets. We then do a separate calculation for the Goodwill, which is this, this calculation that we've got here. So I've said in RAND at acquisition date, it was 548,100, we calculate that. So in MET, we uh, divide that by 0.21 to get the MET value. Now the beginning of the current year, up to the beginning of the current year, the spot rate was 0.23. So if we translate that to RAND then again, the 2.6 million gives us a 600,000 RAND a goodwill figure, which means we have an FCTR in our goodwill of 52,200. Yeah? Similarly, if we do the same thing for um, at the end of the year, our spot at the end of the year was 0.27. So we translate the goodwill at the end of the year to spot at the end of the year, and that then gives us a 704,700. So it was 600. 1,300 Rand at the beginning of the year, at 704, 700 at the end of the year, which then means the movement in the goodwill is 104, 400. Okay. Then the last thing that, that I want to talk you guys through in, in, in these calculations is, of course, the checklist. So H is profit. We don't necessarily need to calc calculate that because we're not doing the um, statement of changes and uh, we're not doing the retained earnings and we're also not calculating PL. So that, I'm just going to make a note here, not applicable. A group profit, okay, so remember group profit, if you lose control, if you don't lose control, it's called changes in ownership. In this case, we haven't lost control, so we will have a change in ownership that is relevant. A fair value adjustment, it's not applicable because we haven't lost control. Realized reserves, we say yes, we have an FCTR, so we have to adjust for that. Yeah, so let's start with the easy one, the reserves. So if we look at our FCTR, as at the, the date of the change, which was, I suppose, the end of the current year. Okay, so this period here, I'm just going to draw, draw a, put a orange block there. The value of our pi, or, or if we calculate our FCTRs at that date, we could see that the value of the FCTR was the 316900 that we calculated and the 664. Um, uh, 450. So in total, the FCTR is 981.350. So it's the sum of, of those two. Yeah. One of the things that we do know is that there's been a 15% change. So we've lost 50%, 15% and we've given it to the NCI. So that's why I've got here marked as a 15% move of that value of FCTR. We need to give that value to, to the NCI. Yeah. So if we maybe just go have a squiz at, at the solution quickly. So I know I'm, I'm muddling um, part A, part A and part B, but I just want to, you know, it's, it's just easier if you do all of them at, at the same time. Yep. So if we go look at, at the solution on the statement of change in equity, there we go. So we see that there's an FCTR that we reduce 
okay? And that we give to the NCI. It's the exact same figure because we've lost 15% of, of our value. And there we go. Right, so that's done, realizing reserves. Let's have a look at changes in ownership. Okay, what is your percentage before? So we know the value of the pie is this 4.5 million. Our percentage before would have been 75% of that. Our percentage after is 60%. So that means in total, we've given up to the NCI 689,776. Okay, so that's the value of the pie that we've given up. How much did we get for this value? All right, so how we calculated this, we then said it was 15,000 shares, because remember they said we sold 15% of 100,000 shares. So it's 15,000 shares. And at what price did we sell it at? Okay, we sold it at the fair value, which is 250. And the exchange rate at that point was 0.27. So it's 15,000 shares at 250 mets times 0.27. So that means we would have made a profit of 322734. All right. But in addition to that profit, ladies and gents, we would have also realized uh, what I want you guys to see is that if you look at these journal, uh, these calculations, can you see that your FCTR increases your equity? All right. So we are crediting equity, which means we are debiting the OCI. Yeah. So can you see, because we're debiting, it means that this is a loss. Now, what I'm telling you is that in this particular case, we have given up 15% of our value of the power, but in that is sitting a loss on these foreign exchange movements. Okay. So not only do I give up 15% of the pie, I also give up 15% of the loss. So effectively, my change in ownership will be what we, the profit that we would have made on the pie, on selling the pie, plus what is the percentage of the loss that you've given away. So that gives you a 496,937. And if we go check our statement of changes in equity on the solution, our changes in ownership, there we go, 469,937. Okay. We'll come back now to the statement of change in equity. All I really want to do is uh, run through part A to complete our, our non-current assets of this um, non-current asset section. All right. So remember what we do, guys, is we start here and uh, we journalize the why. All right. So there's a revaluation that's been done on this particular asset of 170, uh, 250,000, 250,000 mets. Yeah. But if we then calculate, well, what is the carrying amount of this at the end of the year? So it started off with 250. We then depreciated 31 and 62.5. So our carrying amount is then in medical 156,250. How we get that is by saying it's the 250 revaluation minus the depreciation that we've already calculated. And then we, we multiply this, or we uh, translate this to RAND at the spot at the end of the year. Okay, so effectively what it means is that we need to increase the value of our RAND by 42,118 okay, of our PPE. Yeah, so if we go to the first part or the first part of, of the calculations, okay, how we get this number, 42,118. Okay. Remember, guys, they did say we have control. Okay, so much like all the other, other subs, we start off with 100% H, 100% S. Okay, so 8.6 million, 100% H. Okay, and on our deferred tax, there was a deferred tax provided there, there as well. Okay, so that pretty much covers up all of our components on, on the PPE and how we get this 414118. Our goodwill, investment in our goodwill, how we get that. Okay, so we said at acquisition date, it was 548, but that was obviously at the exchange rate at that point in time. If we calculated this at the end of the year using the end of the year's exchange rate, we'd get a 704. Let me just make this a funky orange, 704, 700. Okay, so in our goodwill figure, we will then also have a 704, 400. Okay. Our investments, okay, so remember as we carry on journalizing, journalizing, we eliminate the investment, we bring in the NCI and we bring in the Goodwill. So our investment's currently sitting at 299,500, okay? 
And there we go, 299,500. Now, I know many of you will ask, well, why is it for all the other assets? Do we use the spot rate at the end of the year? But on the investment, we're using the spot rate at acquisition dates. Now, that's for the simple reason, guys, that the investment is sitting in Joe's books. Okay, So Joe would have paid a RAND equivalent at that point in time, and that will never be revalued because it was a RAND expenditure. For all the other assets, those are the assets that are sitting in Lou's books, and Lou's uh, obviously preparing their books in medical, and that's what gets, gets translated at the end of the every year. So that's how come the other assets get revalued, but the investment doesn't. Okay. Right, so this is all relatively chilled stuff. We've covered all of this. Okay. So of course, if we're looking at the um, at the carrying amount of the machinery, so we said it was one forty eight seven fifty. Okay, which was um, well, obviously after the the adjustments on on the deferred tax or the FCTR portion, but we've already included all of those those in our in our calculations. Okay, that's the forty two one 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 eight eight that we've already calculated. And of course, this will then be the depreciation. So if we go back to this, this calculation here, okay, so you'll see our deferred tax is effectively then going to be the deferred tax that we would have raised on the revaluation, less what we would have realized in year one and year two from the excess depreciation. So that leaves us with 50,000 METs and translated at spot at the end of the year, that will then give you 13,500 Rand. And that's effectively this number that, that they have here. Yeah. Calculation of goodwill, we've covered that already on, on the analysis. Okay. Changes in ownership, we've done this already on, on the analysis. Just this particular number, guys, in terms of or how, how is the NCI adjusted? I've done a separate calculation for you on this here. So if we look at the adjustment on, on the NCI, right? Remember, your pie is only so big, 4.98 million. So if you're going to say that you're giving up 15% of the pie, obviously the NCI is going to be the one who takes over that slice of the pie. So that's why in this calculation you have specifically said given to NCI. And you see that coming through here in the calculation, as well as the fact that they're going to take their loss of, of the foreign, um, the, foreign um, uh, the FCTR. Okay, but we'll get to um, the calculations now now. All right. Um, if we look at your non-controlling interest opening balance, okay, so if you look at how we've calculated this, our NCI opening balance, we get a total opening balance of 928.553 for the year, and they've got that exact same figure, 928.553. Okay, this uh, NCI Rob that was given to us directly in, in the question. Okay, if we look at our NCR for um, the current year or our FCTRs, so all of these guys, these translac uh, tra uh, calculations are effectively done on our, on our analysis. Okay, so here we've calculated that our FCTR is 316,900. Remember, the NCR will get their share of 25% on that, so they'll get 79,225. Okay, 79,225 as, let me just change that color quickly to align it with blue. Um, 79,225, that's what the, the NCI would, would get. And then of course the parent would get the parent share, okay, of this 237,635, uh, which is I suppose the parent 75%, but in addition they also get the NCI of um, the FCTR on the Goodwill. All right, so I'm just going to highlight these in a funky red color. Okay, so if we sum up the opening balance of your FCTR in last year's adjustment to Google, it gives you a 289.875. And that's exactly what we have on, on the solution, 298.875. Similarly, if we're going to do the calculation for the current year, guys, okay, we have an FCTR um, total comprehensive income attributable to NCI. We have an FCTR of 166,113. 
okay, which is the 166, 113. And there's obviously additional adjustments of uh, to the NCR 59944, which is effectively just your share of the profits and the adjustments on, on the additional depreciation. So that's how they get that 59544 there, guys. Okay, so this calculation here is effectively how we calculate the FCTR. Obviously, there's a goodwill portion. Um, so, I mean, all of that, I'm not going to go through that. We've done those calculations already on, on the analysis. Okay, so the last thing that I actually want to do with, with you guys is then maybe go have a look at the statement of changes in, in equity. Yeah. So I changed an ownership reserve. Obviously, we only had a change in the current year. So we, we've done that, that calculation already. Uh, FCTR, we said, was the sum of the opening balance. Okay, So like we said, if we add the opening balance of, of FCTR or our portion of it plus the goodwill, <coughs> it gives you the 290, um, 289.875. And that's the opening balance that we've got there. Okay. If we look at our total comprehensive income for the year, so that's calculation 22 and 23. We'll go have a look at those now. Transfer of the FCTR, we've already discussed that. Okay. Our NCR's calculation 20 and 21, we've covered those already. Our total comprehensive income, we've covered that already. The last little bit that we have to look at is this transfer on, on NCR 542. And how we get that is quite simple. Okay, we've already calculated that the uh, from a, a normal power point of view, I'm going to highlight this in um, maybe this dark green. We're giving up the uh, giving the NCR 689776, but remember they're also then picking up this 147 loss. So if you look at what the NCR gets at the end, okay, 542563, and that's how we get this 542563. In, in this this calculation. Okay, so overall, guys, I think um, from from an, this question did definitely have the potential um, to to get you confused. A lot of moving parts, a lot of pieces. I think what was important here was specifically to try and keep your your wits about you. So when you get the required, guys, um, depends on on what your your preference is, and you have to do what's what's best for you. Um, but generally, in my mind, I, I prefer if there is a part A and a part B where they are linked, I prefer dealing with one subsidiary at a time, put everything for part A, put everything for part B, and then that sub is done. As opposed to doing everything for part A on all three subs, then going back to try and do everything on part B for all three subs, but then remembering what has happened in each individual um, individual sub. Okay. But overall, it was um, a quite quite a nice question. I, I, I did enjoy it, um, and I think it it, it is a, a relatively good standard. Uh, one of the things that, that I do need to mention, guys, is obviously from a, an exam layout point point of view, um, the technique is one thing, but how you present your answers in, in a question like this. I mean, you guys can see uh, there's a total of twenty different calculations that are being done, so you could prejudice yourself quite extensively um, in the case where you don't lay out your things neatly for a marker to follow what it is that that you've done because especially after a 54 mark mark question they would probably already spend an hour marking at this they can't trace your your train your train of thought or your thought pattern um, you're going to have a, a marker who's generally not going to look for your uh, for your marks okay so just do it in such a way guys that it's user friendly for for your markers and um so that they can be as favorable towards you as as possible okay